Okay, so today we're going to talk about space. Space is usually a good thing in chess, but as in other aspects of life, there is such a thing as too much of a good thing. So one of the dangers that can happen when you have too much space is that you kind of leave behind weaknesses in your camp. And if your opponent can kind of make some sort of breakthrough, your opponent can exploit those weaknesses potentially. So you just have to be careful when you when you push your pawns to gain space. Because you know pawns can't move backwards and every pawn move you make makes more squares weak. So let's take a look at this game from the Spanish League. It's just completed. So you have this con. This is all kind of book. Okay. So already we see who has more space here. Well, uh, white. White has this nice phalanx of pawns that he's intending to push. But I can already notice that by pushing these pawns he's kind of left behind some some squares in his path. And so, you know, White hasn't really concerned himself about completing his development. He's keeping his bishop on c1, and he's not electing to castle yet. But he is just gaining a ton of space. So knight c5, getting ready to capture two bishops at some point, and also giving his knight this d7 square. So we knight of d7, bishop d2, g6 trying to stem the tide a bit. Now h4. So notice how all of <coughs> White's kingside pawns are past the fourth rank. So it's going to discourage Black from castling kingside, but at the same time he also has pawns in the center that are far up, so Black's king probably won't feel safe in the center. And if Black castles queen side, well then Black doesn't really have an attack on the queen side. Black wants to try to use his half open c file to put pressure on, on, on White's king should White castle queen side. So Black just develops with a gain of tempo. Knight of 3. b5 gains the space for himself. And now White plays h5. Center bishop b7, h6, bishop f8. So this has all actually been played before. And if you notice, white has claimed a tremendous amount of space on the king side, but part of having claimed this space is that it's actually not going to be trivial for him to open up lines on the king side. Because if he ever plays this move f5, the problem is he gives away this e5 square for, for the knight. And again, it's always possible that black can just castle queenside and, and, and avoid this, these pawns coming down, down the kingside. Okay, so uh, white has a choice here of which way to castle. So let's ask the question, which way do you guys think white will castle? Do you guys think white will castle this way? Or do you guys think white will castle this way? King side or queen side? So yeah, white white's king's primary concern is safety, but it turns out that it's probably actually safer to castle king side here. Because if you castle queen side, then you know b four knight b one, all of a sudden. King is 
not looking so hot after queen a5 maybe. Well maybe just a5 actually. And now white just wants to play like rook c8, or black wants to play rook c8. And actually black will feel reasonably safe on the king side because even though white has a ton of space there, it, it is somewhat blocked up. And black will kind of have a free hand on the queen side to, you know, push his pawns. So white chose to castle king side because he believed it was safer. Not, not an unreasonable assumption. So black just played bishop b7, getting ready to give himself the same question. b4. Knight takes e3, c takes e3. And now, which way do you think black castles? This, this one's more obvious, but is black castle king side or queen side here? This one is definitely more obvious. So the fact that this C file is now completely opened probably means that we don't want to castle queen side. Uh, a rook on C1 would would be rather uh, rather embarrassing. I think this actually just wins material. So you're threatening knight d5. And you can play like queen b6 check, but then bishop e3. So I think black's actually lost here. Um, but you know. Like at first glance, you might think, okay, castling kingside looks a little risky just because of you know these books, not king d8. But castling kingside looks risky just because of this pawn on h6. But it's definitely the safer of the two options. <laughs> definitely the safer of the two options. Yeah. So so castling kingside is is what black did. And now we just have a position. So if you notice, you know, black only has one pawn past the f past the third rank, which is this guy. White has pretty much every pawn he owns, at least on the fourth or greater. He has this guy, these two, and then these two. Only pawns that aren't pulling their own weight are these two guys. So black has only one pawn on the fourth, white has five pawns on the fourth or greater. So definitely a huge space edge for white, but um, you know, what does white really have here? It's, not, it's really difficult for him to play f5, because again he gives away the e5 square. He can't really play e5, because he opens up the bishop. If he plays d4, he has to watch out that he's giving a d4 square to a, to a knight, and also it weakens the pawn on e4. So he can't really mm, gain any more space, and he doesn't really have any great places for his pieces either. You know, I mean, he can put a rook on c1, he can maybe try to transfer a queen to b2, try to get something going on this diagonal, maybe transfer a knight to g4, put pressure on f6. But it's actually difficult to see how how white is going to improve his position. I mean, it looks good here, but how to gain further momentum. Whereas black, for his part, can actually do useful things. You know, he can put a rook on c8. He can think about at some point playing e5 or, or d5, depending. And d5 frees this bishop. And e5, the goal of that is to try to gain squares for your pieces. So, you know, maybe after e5, this knight can kind of hop around to d4. Also, black can consider playing f6 and just challenging, challenging the uh, the pawn chain and getting his rook active. So uh, black has all these ideas of, of kind of how to how to bite at this pawn chain of whites, this kind of snake pawn chain. Whereas white, for his part, doesn't really have much he can do. But you know, white definitely has control of more squares, more more territory. Um, so, you know, the computers think that white's doing quite well here. Some computers even give white as much as a, a pawn advantage, but if you really look closely, like, it seems that black has, you know, kind of the, the momentum on his side because he can do things that are more, more proactive than, than white can. So it's weird. And, and if you notice, like, white's pieces seem more aggressively placed than black's, but if you actually think about it, black's pieces are doing more than white's pieces, right? Because, like, okay, this knight really has no place to go. This knight really has no place to go. Okay, it can go to d4, I suppose. But it's just walk, asking for trouble on d5, or d4. This bishop is kind of stuck, because it's technically a bad bishop. Most of the pawns are on dark. Whereas uh, black's pieces are actually kind of doing stuff from afar. This bishop is hitting e4. This bishop is controlling this diagonal, which may be important after f6, and also is eyeing this diagonal, which may be important after d5. 
This knight is eyeing the key spurs e5 and f6 and can also hop into c5. I mean c4 after b6 and if the pawn on d3 moves. And also it helps supports an e5 pawn advance. Um, so, you know, black has kind of like a hedgehoggy type, you know, piece formation with, you know, bishop on b7, bishop on e7, and pawns on b6 and, and, and e6, but for all, all of white's, you know, spatial trumps, it's, it's hard to say that white is actually better here. Okay, so white tries to improve positioning of this knight, because remember, that's kind of one of his worst pieces in a way, because it has no forward force spots to go to, so he plays knight to d1, rook c8, just controlling c5, knight to f2, bringing the knight around, and now uh, black plays, oh, did I miss a move? Oh yeah, sorry, I missed the move, I missed the move, sorry. So he played rook to c1 first, which makes sense. And now black plays queen to d8. It looks awkward to move the queen to its original square, but the idea is that he wants to keep control of this diagonal. And also he wants to put some pressure on this diagonal because he maybe wants to play f6 at some point and put pressure on this g5 pawn. So, you know, queen d8 maybe makes more sense than say queen b8 or, or even queen b6 check. Because queen b6 check, I just play bishop e3 and kind of force you to move again. But queen d8, you kind of keep both options open. Okay, so then knight d1 rook c8 was played. And knight f2. Okay, so rook takes c1. And now white took with the bishop as opposed to taking with the rook because he realizes that when he takes with the rook, okay, it's an open file, but if, if you notice, this square, this square, this square, and this square are all covered. So the rook has a nice open file, but really no entry points. Whereas by playing bishop takes, he has this idea to play like bishop b2 maybe, or even queen to b2 and threaten mate on g7. So he's trying to eye this long diagonal that he's kind of poked holes in with this, this pawn advance. So the question here is, what should what should black do? So you guys have an idea what should black do here? Anybody? Okay, so believe it or not, black should use the um, black should use the tried and true formula of how to kind of counteract a wing attack. Because if you notice right now, white kind of has this like wing attack going on the king side. So what's the best way to counteract an attack on the wing? It's by counterattacking in the center. So actually both central breaks are very logical. Both e5 and d5 are, are great moves. Both e5 and d5 are great moves. So the other candidate for break is f6, but unfortunately f6 loses to knight d4 when you can't defend e6. So 
so again, always be careful about pushing pawns because they um, they create holes that you may not be able to patch up. So you'd like to play f6, but you can't, unfortunately, because of knight d4. But both e5 and f and d5 make a lot of sense. So what's what's the uh, What's the thinking? So when you play e5, the idea is, well, you're kind of chipping away at this pawn chain. You're trying to make your bishop better if he takes. If he pushes, he loses control over g5. I mean, somewhat. Not, not, not enough to, like, lose, lose a piece or anything, but... Also, if he takes, your, your knight gets control of the square e5. And now all of a sudden your knight's doing quite well. And after knight takes, pawn takes, all of a sudden your queen is a monster. And these bishops are doing quite well now. And f6 is always a, a threat, as well as bishop takes g5. So you don't really want to take. It also blocks this diagonal, so there's no more mate issues. So it's a multi-purpose move. d5, similar idea. You don't really want to play e5 and, and basically make this bishop in, entombed, right? Because now this bishop really has no, no future. You really can only go to e3, that's about it. And black, for his part, just maybe wants to take at some point and create more pressure on e4. Make it so it's more difficult to defend that square. Because now that square wouldn't be defended by a pawn, it would only be defended by pieces. So, you know, black could even go like queen a8 try to pile up and then, you know, rook d8, just, just classic hedgehog type type moves. So both moves are perfectly good. Uh, black chose e5, which is good. Okay, so white plays queen to b2, so obviously if pawn takes pawn there's a little thing called checkmate. So now, another thing that e5 did was it took away the square d4, so we can play f6. And lo and behold, look all of a sudden what's happening. This pawn chain that looked kind of so impregnable a couple of moves ago, all of a sudden now is being attacked on all fronts. You have e takes f4, you have f takes g5. And it's making this bishop worse, but it's only temporary because, you know, these exchanges on, on f4, e5, and g5, f6 uh, can't really be avoided. So white played queen b3 check. Check. Because now he notices that the queen is not, oops, the queen is not really doing much on this diagonal anymore, so he switches check. his avenue of attack. And now, what, what should black play here? What should black play here? check somehow. The question is how. So rook f7 is probably not the move you want to make because it actually allows this cute tactic of f5. And the point is you can't take because of g6. And you can't take because of h7. And all of a sudden I'm getting several queens. You can't play king f8 because of mate. You can't take because I take your rook. Check. And if you play king g7 I have this very nice deflection bishop h6. Check. And you lose all your pieces. So rook f7 is not to be recommended. I mean, of course, you don't have to take on f5, but 
F5 does give white some good chances. King H8, of course, is a very natural move, and nothing wrong with it. But the real, the real move that black should play here is D5. Again, remember I said a couple moves ago that he wants to play D5 anyway. So it involves, you know, a, a pawn sacrifice of sorts, but it, it, it improves the lot of life of this bishop. And it also improves the lot of life of this bishop, because, okay, if white takes on D5, I mean, this pawn cannot be held for very long. This pawn cannot be held for very long. And this bishop is going to become quite strong. And now all of a sudden, this king is starting to feel a little more, a little more unsafe than it did, say, 10 moves ago because black's pieces are suddenly getting good squares. Suddenly getting good squares. So yeah, d5 is, is actually correct. Okay, but white can, you know, if he plays very accurately, can neutralize this a little bit. Because again, he does have a lot of space. So okay, he takes on d5, threatening, of course, d6, which would be very strong. So black blocks. And now white makes an accurate move, knight to e4, hitting the blockader. Also hitting f6, so black has to do something about this, so he plays queen b6 check, check, gaining a tempo with which to defend his bishop. Okay, now the question is what should white play here? So white played a move that probably deserves a better fate. White played d4, which isn't you know bad in and of itself. His idea is that he wants to kind of do the same thing black did. So now if black takes on d4, the point is now this pawn is stronger. So he can feel more confident about this, this structure surviving. And if he takes on f4, well, we'll see what happens because that actually happened in the game. Um, but of course he could consider a move like, you know, rook f2 or king g2 and not, not even going for this complication. Uh, I mean, not, not that it's necessarily bad, it's just um, he have to find some accurate moves in order to save it. Because again, this move d4 doesn't accomplish nearly as much as black's d5 did. Because, you know, white's not really liberating a bishop on e2. White is liberating the bishop on c1 because, you know, his idea is that, okay, if he takes, then this pawn is going to be weak and I can eventually win it and get a, a strong bishop myself. But of course, you know, black won't take this way and he'll take on f4 as, as he did in the game. So e takes f4 is correct to still make this bishop technically bad because of this pawn on d4. Uh, okay. So now, um, one of the strengths of this pawn on d4, though, is that now it supports c5 even more. Oops. So now this knight can hop into c5. Of course, threatening knight takes d7, winning everything. So black has to do something about that. And black, of course, doesn't want to take because he loses a piece. And gives white super strong pawns if he takes for the bishop. So he plays queen c7. Okay, now, dear viewers, this is the real the real point in the position that you guys need to figure out. What should white do here? What should white do here? Because this is a chess tempo problem, but not for the reasons you think. Not for the reasons you think, so. What do you guys think? White should play here. I'll give you guys about a minute to think about it.
All right. So most of you were lured by the same thing that the 2650 Grandmaster, which was 96. But 96 actually loses the game. 96 loses the game. Um, And the correct move is Bishop takes out 4. So the point, of course, is um, is that you cannot take this, tempting as it may be, because of chest tempo, 101, double attack. So if you can't take it, what can you do? Well, you actually have to do chest tempo 102, which is perpetual check. And so the way to do that is capture, capture. If you take here, I take here. And then I'm threatening your knight. I'm also threatening d6, d7, d8. So if you, for example, if you take, I take. So I'm threatening this. And this knight's actually trapped, I guess. I didn't even realize that. But also I'm just starting to go up here and here and here. So you can't do that. So you got to take. And now I take with my pawn. And this end game is bad if you take on d5 bad because this past pawn is strong so black's best is to go for this draw check With check and check check because if um because if knight h2, this is actually bad for white now because of take, take, check, check, king g1, and now f takes g5. And now this is actually good for black. Because we both have passed pawns, but a bishop is much better at stopping passed pawn than a knight is. So my king's going to get to f5, and I'll just push this pawn. And my pawn, you can never do anything with your pawn. So there's a big difference between this and this. Right? Because now the difference is I can take, check, take, and I can take here. And the minor piece ending is going to be one for me, so you have to take here and go to this rook ending. Oops. You have to go to this rook ending, but this is kind of hopeless because you're down a pawn, and I have two pass pawns. It's just really bad. But you have, you do have a draw. You do have a draw with queen here and queen here. And I, I, I can't do anything better than to repeat. Check. Check. And neither can you. If you try to do something, I'm, I can actually mate you. <laughs> so for example, if you go like here, you can go c6 and d6 probably, and then like queen c3, threaten mate. And of course, you, I mean, you still have the draw always, but um, you know, actually still continue to try to win, you, you could actually lose. Uh, so this doesn't work. But bishop f4 is, is kind of the way to go, and this, this kind of whole sequence is forced. But instead, white was tempted by 96. So why is this bad? Well, the problem is that this knight is worth way more than this rook in this position, right? I mean, look, look at this position, right? What would you rather have, this knight on c5 or this rook on f8? I mean, just in terms of power of the pieces, this knight is much, much superior. So, you know, when you, when you exchange pieces, you have to ask yourself not only about you know, the relative value, or, or you know, the, the point value of the piece, but also the relative value of the piece in the position. And particularly knight on e6 is worth more than a rook on f8. So... After queen b8, Well, in for a penny, in for a pound, I gotta take. And queen takes. Okay, but now let's take stock of what's happening here. Well, you're gonna lose this pawn. Because I'm playing knight to b6 and bishop takes d5.
And if you take this pawn, not only can I take here, but I can also take here. And I can start generating some threats on, uh, on your king. Like if this knight moves, my bishop and my queen would be attacking h1. And you can't really make progress here. Because my bishop is actually a really great blockader. And your knight's not really in the, in the right spot to um, to break this blockade. Because if you move your knight, I can always just simply take on g5. And these pawns become very strong. And that's actually kind of what happened in the game. So uh, white played rook e1, natural move. But now knight b6, and all of a sudden white's position is collapsing. g takes f6, bishop takes d5, fork. So the queen has to stay on the knight. Queen d3. And now black could actually even take on b4 with a gain of tempo first before deciding to take on f6. But black was pragmatic, simply took on f6. And now the problem is these two bishops are strong, but what the real problem is is these pawns are going to be marching. And white's pieces can't really do anything about it. This rookie eight check does nothing, king f7. And if you just notice, all these squares are protected. All these squares are protected. So it looks loose, but all, all these pieces kind of defend each other. So White's game quickly went downhill, a3. And um, knight to d7. Rookie eight check. check. Knight of eight, just, just to not have to play king of seven. King f2, g5, knight e5, g4. Of course, you can't play knight takes g4 because of queen h4 check. check. And I win the knight. King e1, g3. Knight f3, trying to stop queen h4. But queen takes h6, and I can still get to the h file. And after knight g1, queen h1, uh, black wins, white resign. Because there's really no stopping queen takes knight. If queen f1, I can actually even go bishop to g2. <laughs> and now your queen is stuck. Has to go back to d3, only move. Or e2, but I can just take on, take on g1. And that's going to be the game. So as you see, White White had a lot of a lot of space in the middle game, but he kind of overvalued his his pieces, undervalued his opponent's pieces, and Black was able to kind of counterattack and get get some key squares for his pieces thanks to e5 and d5. And next thing you know, the side of the board where white had all the space, black ended up getting these two pass pawns.